Hi, welcome to the latest instalment of questions about Anne Boleyn. My favourite topic. I'm Claire Ridgway, I'm author of The Fall of Anne Boleyn, A Countdown, and also several other books on Anne Boleyn and the Boleyns. And I also run the Anne Boleyn Files website as well. So Anne Boleyns are pretty important to me. Right, I'm sorry, I'm a bit out of breath because I've been rushing around the place. We've got building work and all sorts going on, but uh, I've retreated to the calm of the roof terrace to try and get away from drilling and dust and all sorts of things. Uh, that's the, uh, the thing about having a 364-year-old house. It's a bit of a project. Right, let's get back to Anne Boleyn. Okay. Um, in part one of this two-part series, looking at Anne Boleyn and other men, I talked about the marriage negotiations which led to Anne Boleyn being recalled from France where she was serving Queen Claude, Queen Consort of King Francis I. Um, those negotiations were to do with her marrying James Butler. And then I talked about her rather short-lived romance with Henry Percy, who was the son and heir of the Earl of Northumberland, a romance that got uh, broken up by Cardinal Wolsey and Henry's uh, father, the Earl of Northumberland. I'll give you a link to see that video because really you ought to watch that one first. I mean, they do stand alone, but really they, they are in chronological order. So today I'm going to talk about the other men that have been linked to Anne Boleyn, men other than obviously the main man in her life, King Henry VIII. Now the next man that Anne's name was linked to after Henry Percy was poet and diplomat Sir Thomas Wyatt the Elder. And we call him Sir Thomas Wyatt the Elder because there was another Sir Thomas Wyatt, his son, who was a rebel in Queen Mary I's reign, who led Wyatt's rebellion and was subsequently executed. So we're not talking about that one, we're talking about his father, Sir Thomas Wyatt the Elder, who was a famous Tudor poet and was also um, an ambassador for Henry VIII. Now, Wyatt had been brought up at Allington Castle, which is in Kent, and it's not far at all from Hever Castle, which of course was Anne Boleyn's family home. We don't know whether before she went to France, whether she had sort of much contact with the Wyatts, but she surely would have known uh, the family. Now, Thomas Wyatt married Elizabeth Brooke, who was daughter of Lord Cobham in 1520. And the couple had a son, Thomas Wyatt the Younger, in 1521. However, this marriage between Thomas and Elizabeth was not a happy one at all. Um, and according to Wyatt's grandson, George Wyatt, who wrote a sympathetic biography of Anne Boleyn uh, in Queen Elizabeth I's reign, Thomas Wyatt fell in love with Anne Boleyn sometime after her return to uh, the English court, sometime after she uh, made her debut at the court in 1522. George Wyatt wrote that when Wyatt saw Anne, this new beauty, he was surprised somewhat with the sight thereof and that he could gladly yield to be tied forever with the knot of her love. Now Anne, was probably involved with Henry Percy at this time um, and Wyatt wasn't free to be tied to her with the knot of love forever anyway because he was married to Elizabeth Brooke. Unhappily, but he was married. Somewhere between 1524 and 1526, historians argue over this, Anne Boleyn began to be pursued by King Henry VIII, another married man. George Wyatt tells a very interesting story, a sort of family anecdote uh, concerning Thomas Wyatt while Anne was being courted by the king. He tells of how Thomas was entertaining Anne one day as she did needlework and playfully grabbed a jewel that was hanging by a lace from her pocket. 
Christmas, Wyatt decided to keep this jewel as a trophy and wore it around his neck. So he had something of Anne's close to him. When the King and Wyatt were playing bowls one day, they argued over a shot. Wyatt declared that it was his. But the King declared, Wyatt, I tell thee, it is mine, as he pointed to the wood with the finger on which he wore Anne's ring, so a ring that Anne had given him. Wyatt saw the ring and replied, and if it may like your majesty to give me leave to measure it, I hope it will be mine. And he took the jewel from around his neck and began to measure the cast with the ribbon. This angered the king who broke up the game and demanded, he went and demanded an explanation from Anne as to how Wyatt had got hold of this object, this jewel that was hers. So these two men playing bowls but actually arguing over a woman. So look, I've got her ring. Well, look, I've got her jewel. You can just imagine it as a bit playgroundy, isn't it? Wyatt's poetry appears to be evidence of his love for Anne Boleyn as well. His riddle poem, What Word Is That That Changeth Not, has the answer, Anna. And in The Lover Confesseth Him In Love With Phyllis, he writes of that brunette, which is taken to refer to Anne as well. And then, of course, there's his very, very famous poem, Who So List To Hunt, which tells of a man, Wyatt himself, hunting a deer, a hind, with little chance of success, and then having to withdraw from the hunt because of another hunter. Um, this other hunter claims the hind for himself. And if we see Anne as the hind, which is how people do read this poem, uh, Wyatt is talking of having to withdraw um, his suit, his, his wooing of Anne, um, because she is now the property um, of the king. For Caesar's I am is written uh, on a sort of collar around this hind's neck. She's become Caesar's, she's become the ruler's, she's become Henry VIII's and she isn't Wyatt's and Wyatt can have no hope of having her. So it seems that his love for her was unrequited, but then Wyatt was really in no position to woo Anne Boleyn having a wife, Elizabeth Brooke, but then you could say that neither was Henry VIII being married to Catherine of Aragon. Now in May 1536, at the fall of Anne Boleyn, Sir Thomas Wyatt was arrested and thrown into the Tower of London. However, he was never mentioned in the indictments of charges. He was never tried. He was not taken to trial with Mark Smeaton, Henry Norris, William Brereton, Sir Francis Weston, and George Boleyn, Lord Rochford. And Wyatt was eventually released in June 1536. Now, it is not known whether his father, Sir Henry Wyatt's close friendship um, and really good relationship with Thomas Cromwell saved Wyatt, or whether Wyatt and another man who was arrested at the same time and then really subsequently released, Sir Richard Page, whether they were just apprehended and imprisoned to make the investigation into Anne Boleyn's behaviour, into these alleged claims about Anne Boleyn, whether it was to make it kind of look good and look more thorough. You know, look, we've rounded up all these men and, and we found two of them, you know, there, there's, there's nothing against them, we'll, we'll release them. Whether it was just to make everything look good. After Anne's fall and Wyatt's subsequent release, Henry VIII made Wyatt um, an ambassador to the court of Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor. However, Wyatt got into trouble again in 1541. He was charged with treason for making rude comments about the king and also for dealing with Cardinal Reginald Pole, a man who had spoken out in the past against Henry VIII's um, annulment, a man who was seen as an enemy of Henry VIII. 
Wyatt was once again thrown into the Tower of London. And this time he had no father to help secure his release because his father had died in November 1536. And also Cromwell was dead by this time too. But this time round, it was Queen Catherine Howard, Henry VIII's fifth wife, who helped secure his pardon and release. But the deal was that if Wyatt was released, then he had to return to his estranged wife, Elizabeth Brooke. In 1542, Wyatt managed to get back into favour. He was restored to his office of ambassador. However, this favour was very short-lived because actually Wyatt was taken ill after receiving the Emperor's envoy at Falmouth and he died on the 11th of October 1542 at Clifton Maybank House, the home of his friend Sir John Horsey in Sherbourne in Dorset. He was laid to rest at Sherbourne Abbey. So that's Sir Thomas Wyatt. In 1536, Anne was obviously uh, linked with five men. The indictments against Anne Boleyn that were drawn up by the Middlesex and Kent uh, juries stated that she, despising her marriage and entertaining malice against the king and following daily her frail and carnal lust, did falsely and traitorously procure by base conversations and kisses, touchings, gifts and other infamous incitations diverse of the king's daily and familiar servants to be her adulterers and concubines. And the indictments go on to say that she procured by sweet words, kisses, touches and otherwise these men and that she had sexual relations with them and also plotted with these men, including her brother George Boleyn, <coughs> to kill her husband, King Henry VIII. Now, the majority of historians today believe that Anne Boleyn was framed and that she was entirely innocent of all the charges against her. And actually, Eric Ives um, pointed out um, that I think three quarters of the charges in the indictments just don't make sense because uh, it, is, it was impossible for Anne Boleyn to be at that place or the man concerned to be at that place and to be together. They just don't make sense. And in a modern court, they would just be thrown out. Uh, they would just be yeah, argued against and thrown out. So most historians believe that these uh, the charges just don't make sense and that Anne Boleyn was completely innocent. However, an article online by a Dr Brian M Collins argued that the baby that Anne Boleyn miscarried in January 1536 was fathered by one of these men, musician Mark Smeaton. Now, I've written quite a detailed article um, on the Anne Boleyn files on Dr. Collins' article and the theories, the evidence that he puts forward and sort of my arguments against that. So I will share a link to that with you because it's very, very detailed. Um, but to suffice to say that I do not believe at all um, that Smeaton fathered Anne's baby and I believe that the so-called circumstantial evidence is not at all convincing. Smeaton may have confessed to sleeping with the Queen when he was interrogated in 1536 and it is it's believed that he was put at least under psychological um, pressure. I mean there, there were rumours that he had been racked although the accounts of his execution don't mention any physical um, injuries but he may have actually as well been offered a deal because as a commoner, he could have, if he was found guilty of treason, he could have suffered the full traitor's death to be hanged, drawn and quartered. Noblemen tended to have their, um, their sentences commuted to beheading, but Smeaton would have been likely to have suffered the full traitor's death. 
was he offered a deal, a more merciful death if you confess? You're going down anyway, we're finding you guilty anyway. How about being beheaded, which takes seconds, instead of the horrible full traitor's death, which takes a long time? And I, I could see someone uh, saying, yes, okay, after lots of psychological pressure, but we don't know. So he may have confessed to sleeping with Anne in 1536, but Anne denied sleeping with him. And she swore twice on the Holy Sacrament that she'd been faithful to her husband. And if she'd been lying on the sacrament, she um, would have felt that her soul was in jeopardy, that she would not have eternal life if she lied on the Holy Sacrament. Anne was also very shocked to hear that at his execution that Mark Smeaton had not taken the opportunity in a speech to retract his confession. Um, his execution was on the 17th of May 1536. When she heard that he'd done nothing to go back on his confession, she said, Has he not then cleared me of the public infamy he has brought me to? Alas, I fear his soul suffers for it, and that he is now punished for his false accusations. But then you do wonder if Mark actually thought that he could be hauled off the scaffold and taken to uh, suffer a full traitor's death if he didn't stick to his story. We don't know. In his poem about the executions of May 1536, Thomas Wyatt the Elder, who knew Mark Smeaton well, who knew all the men that were executed, he was part of their circle, he was good friends with these men and he knew Anne Boleyn and was part of her circle too. He described Mark Smeaton as a rotten twig upon so high a tree. And he's the only one that Wyatt actually criticises in any way in his poetry. A rotten twig. Surely this must be because he knew Smeaton to be lying. He was blaming Smeaton for what was going on. There certainly was no evidence at all of an affair between Smeaton and Anne. No, no witnesses were brought forward at the trial. There was just no evidence. And then there's Sir Henry Norris. Now, Sir Henry Norris was very close to the king. He was a very, very good friend of the king. And he was his groom of the stool as well, a position of real intimacy and influence with the king. And he was one of the men condemned in May 1536, who was executed for allegedly being involved with the Queen and plotting the King's death. Why have I mentioned Sir Henry Norris? Well, in the author's note section of her novel, so it's a fiction, work of fiction, and her novel on Anne Boleyn, Anne Boleyn, A King's Obsession, Alison Weir uh, writes of an attraction between Anne and Norris. She goes on to explain that this was suggested by the wording of her last confession, from her insistence that she had never offended with her body against the king, it might be inferred that she had offended in her heart or her thoughts and that she secretly loved another but had never gone so far as to consummate that love. Alison Weir then states that of the men accused with her, Norris was the likeliest of her affections. Now this is in the author's notes, so that this is Weir not talking fictionally, this is Weir talking factually. But she does say that this is just a theory, just her theory, but that it's a compelling one because we know that Norris did confess to something that he later retracted. I don't agree. I don't agree that this theory is a compelling one and I don't agree with the evidence that Alison Weir sort of uses to back up this theory. Anne's actual words at her last confession, which um, were recorded in French by the Imperial Ambassador Eustace Chapuis in one of his dispatches, actually translate to rather than she had never offended with her body 
G.W. Bernard translates them more accurately to she had not misused herself with her body towards the king. That is slightly different. She had not misused herself with her body towards the king. I think it's quite a leap to go from someone saying that they had not offended the king with their body, they had not misused their body in a way that was against the king, to mean that, well, she hadn't done it with her body, but she had done it with her heart or mind. That's a leap. That's reading far too much into it, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. Anne had been accused in the indictments of offending the king with her body. She'd been accused of committing adultery, of procuring, seducing, and then having sexual relations with five men. These were all offences concerning her, her body. They were concerning physical actions, offences she'd committed against the king with her body. To me, it therefore stands to reason that she would answer that accusation in a confession and that she would deny it. She wasn't being accused of her heart or her mind, uh, you know, offending the king with her heart or mind. She was being accused of sex, of having adultery. So for me, her oath on the sacrament makes perfect sense because she is denying the charges against her. She is swearing her innocence. And it's far too much of a leap for me to think of it as Anne, think, as Anne thinking, well, I'll say I didn't offend him with my, with my body because that's the truth and I'll just hold back about the heart and mind. Now, Anne was an evangelical. She was of the reformed faith and she knew her Bible. She was someone who believed in the authority of scriptures. These, the work she was reading from the French reformers were all, the emphasis was on the authority of scriptures before sort of anything else. And she owned a copy of William Tyndall's translation of the New Testament. And in that uh, version, and in fact in, in the Bible, in all the translations, in the Gospel of Matthew, I recorded the following words spoken by Christ, and I'll read from William Tyndall's uh, translation. Ye have heard how it was said to them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a wife lusting after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. So, even lusting after someone else that was married or if you were married, even thinking about them in that way was adultery, not just having uh, a full-blown sexual relationship with them, just thinking about them, just lusting after them in that way was adultery. Anne was married. These other men George Berlin was her brother, uh, Sir Francis Weston was married, Norris was married, William Brereton was married, Smeaton wasn't married, but Anne was. If she'd thought lustingly about any of these men, she would have believed that she was committing adultery because that's what Jesus Christ said, and she followed the word of Jesus Christ. So for her to have been in love with Norris and to be thinking of him in this way would have con constituted adultery, a sin to Anne. So I can't, I can't believe that someone would claim that they were innocent like that on the Holy Sacrament if they knew that they had lustful thoughts about someone. As for Henry Norris's retracted confession, now this was recorded by Norris's servant, George Constantine, who wrote of how Norris's chaplain had told him that Norris had confessed after being taken to the Tower of London, but that when his confession was laid before him at his trial, Norris stated that he was deceived to do the same by the Earl of Hampton that now is. I.e. Sir William Fitzwilliam, treasurer of the king's household. 
But George Constantine also writes of the king examining Norris himself on their ride back from the May Day joust in 1536 and how Norris at that time would confess no thing to the king even though the king promised him a pardon in case he would utter the truth. So tell me the truth, confess it and I will pardon you, said his very good friend the king. We also know that uh, Norris pleaded innocent at his trial and that he claimed to have been deceived when Fitzwilliam interrogated him. But Constantine doesn't go into any details regarding the confession and then subsequently why Norris felt deceived. Other sources make no mention of Norris's confession. They only mention Mark Smeaton's confession. And Sir Edward Bainton was actually very concerned about the lack of confessions from the other men. He wrote in a letter to Fitzwilliam, This shall be to advertise you that here is much communication, that no man will confess anything against her, but only Mark of any actual thing. Wherefore, in my foolish conceit, it should much touch the king's honour if it should no further appear. And I cannot believe but that the other two be as culpable as ever was he. So Bainton there is clearly saying that only Mark confessed to anything and that this, this is bad news. Uh, you know, the other men haven't confessed and, and that this is bad news. Perhaps as historian Eric Ives in his uh, book The Life and Death of Anne Boleyn pointed out, Norris confessed to his conversation with Anne Boleyn regarding dead men's shoes. Um, if you haven't heard of this, I will be going into it in more detail in my videos on the fall of Anne Boleyn. But shortly before her arrest, Anne Boleyn and Henry Norris had a kind of altercation where Anne was telling Henry Norris off for taking so long in actually getting married to um, her cousin and one of her ladies, Mad Shelton, and uh, was sort of teasing him and kind of telling him off and uh, saying, you know, you're looking for dead men's shoes. In other words, uh, do you fancy me then? You know, it was, it was courtly love. It was flirting in a courtly love sense, but because she mentioned dead men's shoes, she was bringing up the death of the king, which just wasn't done. Um, so perhaps, as Eric Ice points out, perhaps Sir Henry Norris was confessing to having this conversation with Anne, which could be construed to be treason, talking about the death of the king, but denying the implication that he was involved with Anne and that he was plotting to kill the king it's impossible to know. But as Eustace Chapuis, the Imperial Ambassador, pointed out, Weston, Brereton, Rochford and Norris were condemned upon presumption and certain indications without valid proof or confession. So nothing came out of the trial that was evidence of an affair between Anne and any of the men, never mind Norris. It was only Smeaton that confessed. Now I'll give you a link to read more about this, uh, this idea of Anne and Norris uh, being uh, romantically involved, or Anne having feelings for him anyway, and sort of my arguments against that, what, what I believe, um, because it is a very detailed article, very, very long. But suffice to say that I do not believe that Anne Boleyn was romantically involved with any of the men charged in May 1536. I will of course be going into more details on Anne Boleyn's fall in my video countdown to her execution, so keep your eyes peeled for that. I did a video uh, recently asking you if you wanted me to do that on top of my On This Day Judy History uh, videos and there was a resounding yes. Uh, so I will be doing that. It will start, I think I'm going to start on the 24th of April and I'll count down to her execution on the 19th of May, just giving you day by day countdown of the events. Very dramatic, very short time. I mean, it is mind-blowing how quickly everything happened. So I'll be doing that 
for you. But I will give you links to the articles that I've mentioned uh, on Mark Smeaton and Sir Henry Norris uh, just below in the description below. I do hope you're enjoying these questions about Anne Boleyn videos. You can subscribe to the channel by just clicking there. You can hit the bell to be notified as well of new videos. I'm doing On This Day in Tudor History videos too, so there's lots of Tudor history to come. Anyway, thank you for tuning in. Take care. Bye-bye.